Which speedrun is most optimized? It depends how you define it. There are times like 5.57 seconds in Dragster which are perfect and can't be improved at all, but there are other times like the Mario 64 zero star record of 6 minutes and 41 seconds by draws where there is time to be saved, but because this is set in a more complicated game and this time is much shorter compared to a casual playthrough, I'd consider this speedrun to be more optimized. Of course there's a bit of a subjective element to the question, so in this video I'll be going over a few possible answers in no particular order. I hope you enjoy. First we have the Super Mario World Credits Warp. I will say out of all the runs I had to learn for this video, I had the most fun with this one. I'd seen this done a few times before, but you can't really tell what's going on just from watching it. This only works because of a special property of the charge and shot. The game has five intended power-ups which modify Mario's state when collected. It's probably a case of programmer laziness, but for whatever reason, the game also treats the charge and chuck sprites as power-ups. This wouldn't matter because the charge and chuck is an enemy which can't normally be eaten. However, if you grab a coin with Yoshi's tongue, collect the coin as Mario, and then immediately load the chuck at the far right of the screen, the chuck sprite will replace the coin and Yoshi will eat the chuck. This is called item swap. Because the chuck is considered a power-up, when you do this, the game runs the routine which changes Mario's state, and this causes the game's processor to jump to a section of memory which is out of bounds so to speak. It's a section of memory which displays values based on the last value read or written from the memory buffer register. It gets complicated, but all you need to understand is eating any chuck runs part of a memory you're not supposed to, and you can manipulate this code very specifically to do all sorts of things. There are multiple methods for achieving this. The method I used pretty much just required me to throw these Koopas on certain pixels. Furious uses a slightly different setup to get the record of 41.866 seconds, but the end result is the same. Once you have the memory value set, you just do the item swap and beat the game. You know, with every speedrun, there is a theoretical perfect time. It's hard, usually impossible, to know what that time is, but I believe that the Super Mario Bros. speedrun is getting close. The record of 4 minutes and 55.796 seconds is currently held by some West. This is about as optimized as it gets. You're basically running right at full speed from start to finish. That along with the frame rule function means that even if small time savers are found, it likely won't improve the end time at all. For any unfamiliar with frame rules, this game checks every 21 frames to see if Mario has completed the level. If he has, that triggers the game to send Mario to the next level. If he hasn't, the game waits another 21 frames and then checks again. What this means for speedrunners is that you can only save time, level to level, in increments of 21 frames. This pushes the game to be even more optimized because it allows for slight mistakes while still making it to 8.4 at the fastest possible pace. A somewhat recent update to the route was the addition of a frame-perfect pipe clip in 1.2. This allowed runners to save an additional frame rule and made 555 practical, but there are only so many of these optimizations left to find, and eventually, the time will be perfect and we will never see another untied record again. Super Metroid has some of the deepest history of any speed game which dates all the way back to the game's release. This webpage isn't up anymore, but you can still find it archived. This is the earliest claim of a record still surviving today, which was posted back in 2001. Here, HP Solo displayed his 100% run of 1 hour and 28 minutes. The page linked to some demo files which would have allowed us to watch the run, but unfortunately the files are long gone. Still, this gives you a greater perspective on how much time has been put into this game. This run is 18 years old, with consistent improvements following ever since. Even now, the most recent any% percent record was just set by Behemoth a few weeks ago. The reason people have and continue to put so much time into this game isn't just because of its broader popularity, it's actually very technical which can be hard to appreciate without a deeper understanding of the game. Here are just a couple things. First off, every time Samus pumps her arm up or down once, this movement moves her forward one pixel. The difference is hard to notice during live play, but over an entire run this saves multiple seconds. If you jump towards a damage hitbox, then turn around the moment before you get hit, and then go back to holding forward, you'll get boosted through it, which can be used to avoid other damage sources by taking advantage of the invincibility frames after getting hit. If you run at full speed, jump between rooms while holding down, and then before you hit the ground, press down again and then forward, you'll enter your morph ball at running speed. This can be used for a couple sequence breaks. If you crouch at the right time while starting a run, you can store a shine spark, then by pressing jump and right at the same time, you can redirect it forward. Those are just a couple interesting aspects of the game's mechanics. It's a great game all around, and I'd suggest it to anyone just getting into speedrunning. Some people might imagine that speedrunning Pokemon games is just walking around at a fixed pace praying for good luck, but it requires much more thought than that. The amount of energy that's been put into understanding every little aspect of this game, creating new strategies and routing, 
is on another level. But why not skip all of that and walk from your house straight into the Hall of Fame? Pokemon speedrunners don't really take this run seriously, but still, beating any Pokemon game with zero minutes on your timer is as optimal as it gets. This is possible thanks to a save corruption glitch where you save your game and then reset with a precise timing. If you do this right, you'll have a glitched Pokemon menu. Switch the first Pokemon into the first slot off screen, then go to your item menu and throw out this many of the second Master Ball. Now exit your house, and you've beaten the game, with 152 Pokemon, no less. This isn't too hard to do, so go ahead and try it out. With a little practice, you can do this in zero minutes, and claim one of the easiest speedrun records there is. Out of every level in GoldenEye 007, the most optimized is likely the very first. In December of 2017, Carl Jobst achieved a 52 second time on the Agent difficulty, breaking a 15 year old record and untying the 126 others who all had 53 seconds. Let me explain to you just how optimal 52 is. After 53 was achieved, it was found that by using a 2.x control style, you can build up speed in the opening cutscene and start the level running. This saves an additional 0.3 seconds. Then you need to get boosted by the guards three times. This is hard though, because on agent difficulty, the guards only have about a 1 in 10 chance of hitting you each shot. You also need to hope you don't get hit from the front at any point. Some runners were able to get a 53 with zero boosts, so Gold Knight players knew that with clean strafing and a fast gate, 52 could be achieved. But it is so barely possible that the slightest error will mess this up. Carl had an earlier run where he got three boosts, he had a fast gate, and he had clean movement up until the end. But this tiny bit of unoptimal movement was enough to cost him a 52 in this case. He got it in the end though, so congrats to him. Now the only question is, who will be number two? A Link to the Past is one of those games that's so broken that they've banned Out of Bounds, Wrong Warping, Door Glitch, and Exploration Glitch from all their main categories. Normally you'll see speedrunners use every possible glitch to save time, but these glitches are so destructive they don't leave much of a game to play. For example, look at how fast we can beat the game using Exploration Glitch. All the rooms are stored on one sublayer, and by moving onto this sublayer, you can move freely between them. What's more is you can access this sublayer several different ways. The simplest is to clip by running into a wall, alternating directional inputs every other frame. You can use this glitch once to reach the cave and another time to beat the game. It really is that simple, you just clip and walk to the end. Of course I was going to put Ocarina of Time any percent on here. Ocarina of Time has seen a decrease in active players over recent years, but it is my opinion that this remains one of the all-time classic speedruns because of the millions of people who have had their minds blown the first time they saw it. Many of you know by now that you can beat this game in under 20 minutes, but you may not realize just how lucky it is that this whole route works the way it does. You see, whenever you touch a blue portal in this game, it loads an area, entrance, and cutscene value. This tells the game which cutscene to play. Using various methods, you can combine different entrance and cutscene values to warp all over the game. Now it just so happens that combining the values for the Deku Tree Basement and the Kokiri Emerald cutscene put you in the middle of the collapse sequence right before the end of the game. If the game put you just a few minutes back, you'd have to fight Ganondorf and then you need Light Arrow, so that'd be no good. Not only is this wrong warp insanely lucky, but all that is required to do it is a bottle with Fisher Bugs. By using item manipulation, you can give yourself a bottle without ever leaving the forest. And the best part of all is in the very last moment of this run, the very last thing you have to do is deliver the final blow to Ganon, which can only be done with the Master Sword. No other item will work. But before the fight, Ganon knocks away the Master Sword, which automatically equips when you pick it up, even as a child. If it weren't for this, this whole run would have been a dead end. It's almost like Miyamoto himself designed this run. So that's the end of the top 7, but I want to show you guys this Gex task that I made with some help from Timo. I played this in my last video, but I understand a lot of people were confused as to what was happening, so I wanted to show it again, but explain everything going on. This game is near and dear to my heart. It's not well made from a technical perspective, but it has a lot of character, so speedruns of this game have always been of special interest to me. Right off the bat we have a boss key skip. With the right angle you can just jump through that wall and land in the loading zone. That skips most of the game right there. Now we've already made it to the final hub area, but the TV that warps us into the final level isn't activated. For that to be active you need 30 remotes, which takes a long time to get. But there's this bonus TV you don't need any remotes for. What we do is land on the button in the middle of a tail whip. This will delay the cutscene where Gex gets warped into the TV until the tail whip completes. Then you can continually do frame perfect tail whips to keep delaying the cutscene and make your way over to this cave.
And if you do it just right, this warps Gex not into the bonus TV, but into Res Raker, the final level. Pretty cool. That warp was first theorized by a guy named Reese. I was the first one to get it to work, and then Timo had the idea to use the lower TV down on the ground level. And so when you combine that with the boss key skip at the beginning, this any percent run is just you running straight from beginning to end with pretty much no restrictions. Now check this barrier skip coming up. And this is all Timo. I had to call him in on this part because I could not get this to work. Normally you need to fly around to the three power stations and turn them off to remove the barrier and go fight res. But by getting hit by this fire and then flying into the fire again, while you're still in hit stun, you get this tiny speed boost. It's hard to notice it, but if you direct it straight into this corner, you can get just far enough to touch the loading zone behind the barrier and enter the fight with res. And that saves several minutes as well. Now that you're in the fight, this is pretty straightforward. The one thing to pay attention to is right here at the beginning. Watch how I shoot res repeatedly. That is to move him. Every shot that hits him moves him the tiniest bit backwards, and I use that to help manipulate his fighting cycles. During this fight, you have to do a shot from far away to do one damage, then come up closer to bait out his closed attacks. Then you need to get far away again so he opens up his chest. You can do this while remaining on the closed platform if you push res far enough back, so that's what I did. So there you go, that's how you beat Gex 3 in under 3 minutes. That's the end of the video, I hope you guys liked it. I started a Facebook page and I'm going to be posting my videos a little bit earlier over there, so if you want to access that, go follow the page so you're notified when I upload a new video. Alright, thanks. Take care.